This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Servile State by Hilaire Belloc. Section 12. When the transformation is complete, there will be no ground left, nor any demand or necessity for public ownership. The reformer only asked for it in order to secure security and sufficiency. He has obtained his demand. Here are security and sufficiency, achieved by another and much easier method, consonant with and proceeding from the capitalist phase immediately preceding it. There is no need to go further. In this way the socialist, whose motive is human good and not mere organization, is being shepherded, in spite of himself, away from his collectivist ideal and towards a society in which the possessor shall remain possessed, the dispossessed shall remain dispossessed, in which the masses of men shall still work for the advantage of a few, and in which those few shall still enjoy the surplus values produced by labor but in which the special evils of insecurity and insufficiency, in the main, the product of freedom, have been eliminated by the destruction of freedom. At the end of the process you will have two kinds of men, the owners economically free and controlling to their peace and to their guarantee of their livelihood the economically unfree non-owners. But that is the servile state. The second type of socialist reformer may be dealt with more briefly. In him the exploitation of man by man excites no indignation. Indeed he is not of a type to which indignation or any other lively passion is familiar. Tables, statistics, and exact framework for life, these afford him the food that satisfies his moral appetite. The occupation most congenial to him is the running of men as a machine is run. To such a man the collectivist ideal particularly appeals. It is orderly in the extreme. All that human and organic complexity which is the color of any vital society offends him by its infinite differentiation. He is disturbed by multitudinous things, and the prospect of a vast bureaucracy wherein the whole of life shall be scheduled and appointed to certain simple schemes deriving from the coordinate work of public clerks and marshaled by powerful heads of departments gives his small stomach a final satisfaction. Now this man, like the other, would prefer to begin with public property in capital and land, and upon that basis to erect the formal scheme which so suits his peculiar temperament. It need hardly be said that in his vision of a future society he conceives of himself as the head of at least the department, and possibly of the whole state. But that is by the way. But while he would prefer to begin with a collectivist scheme ready-made, he finds in practice that he cannot do so. He would have to confiscate, just as the more hearty socialist would, and if that act is very difficult, the man burning at the sight of human wrongs, how much more difficult is it to a man impelled by no such motive force, and directed by nothing more intense than a mechanical appetite for regulation. He cannot confiscate or begin to confiscate. At the best, he will buy out the capitalist. Now, in his case, as in the case of the more human socialist, buying out is, as I shall show in its proper place, a system impossible of general application. But all those other things for which such a man cares, much more than he does for the socialization of the means of production, tabulation, detailed administration of men, the coordination of many efforts under one schedule, the elimination of all private power to react against his department, all these are immediately obtainable without disturbing the existing arrangement of society. With him, precisely as with the other socialist, what he desires can be reached without any dispossession of the few existing possessors. He has but to secure the registration of the proletariat, next to ensure that neither they in the exercise of their freedom, nor the employer in the exercise of his, can produce insufficiency or insecurity, and he is content. Let laws exist which make the proper housing, feeding, clothing, and recreation of the proletarian mass be incumbent upon the possessing class, and the observance of such rules be imposed by inspection and punishment, 
upon those whom he pretends to benefit, and all that he really cares for will be achieved. To such a man the servile state is hardly a thing towards which he drifts. It is rather a tolerable alternative to his ideal collectivist state, which alternative he is quite prepared to accept and regard favourably. Already the greater part of such reformers who a generation ago would have called themselves socialists are now less concerned with any scheme for socialising capital and land than with innumerable schemes actually existing, some of them possessing already the force of laws for regulating, running, and drilling the proletariat without trenching by an inch upon the privilege in implements, stores, and land enjoyed by the small capitalist class. The so-called socialist of this type has not fallen into the servile state by a miscalculation. He has fathered it. He welcomes its birth. He foresees his power over its future. So much for the socialist movement, which a generation ago proposed to transform our capitalist society into one where the community should be the universal owner and all men equally economically free or unfree under its tutelage. Today their ideal has failed, and of the two sources whence their energy proceeded, the one is reluctantly, the other gladly acquiescent in the advent of a society which is not socialist at all, but servile. Of the practical reformer, there is another type of reformer, one who prides himself on not being a socialist, and one of the greatest weight today. He also is making for the servile state. This second factor in the change is the practical man, and this fool, on account of his great numbers and determining influence in the details of legislation, must be carefully examined. It is your practical man who says, Whatever you theorists and doctrinaires may hold with regard to this proposal, which I support, though it may offend some abstract dogma of yours, yet you must admit that it does good. If you had practical experience of the misery of the Jones family, or had done practical work yourself in Pudsey, you would have seen that a practical man, etc. It is not difficult to discern that the practical man in social reform is exactly the same animal as the practical man in every other department of human energy, and may be discovered suffering from the same twin disabilities which stamp the practical man wherever found. These twin disabilities are an inability to define his own first principles, and an inability to follow the consequences proceeding from his own action. Both these disabilities proceed from one simple and deplorable form of impotence, the inability to think. Let us help the practical man in his weakness, and do a little thinking for him. As a social reformer he has, of course, though he does not know it, first principles and dogmas like all the rest of us, and his first principles and dogmas are exactly the same as those which his intellectual superiors hold in the matter of social reform. The two things intolerable to him as a decent citizen, though a very stupid human being, are insufficiency and insecurity. When he was working in the slums of Pudsey, or raiding the proletarian Jones from the secure base of Toynbee Hall, what shocked the worthy man most was unemployment and destitution, that is, insecurity and insufficiency in flesh and blood. Now if the socialist, who has thought out his case, whether as a mere organizer or as a man hungering and thirsting after justice, is led away from socialism and towards the servile state by the force of modern things in England, how much more easily do you think the practical man will be conducted toward that same servile state like any donkey to his grazing ground. To those dull and short-sighted eyes, the immediate solution which even the beginnings of the servile state propose are what a declivity is to a piece of brainless matter. The piece of brainless matter rolls down the declivity, and the practical man lollops from capitalism to the servile state with the same inevitable ease. Jones has not got enough. If you give him something in charity, that something will soon be consumed, and then Jones will again not have enough. Jones has been seven weeks out of work. If you get him work under our unorganized and wasteful system, etc., he may lose it just as he lost his first jobs. The slums of Pudsey, as the practical man knows by practical experience, are often unemployable. 
then there are the ravages of drink more fatal still the dreadful habit mankind has of forming families and breeding children the worthy fellow notes as a practical matter of fact such men do not work unless you make them he does not because he cannot coordinate all these things he knows nothing of a society in which free men were once owners nor of the cooperative and instinctive institutions for the protection of ownership which such a society spontaneously breeds he takes the world as he finds it and the consequence is that whereas men of greater capacity may admit with different degrees of reluctance the general principles of the servile state the practical man positively gloats on every detail in the building up of that form of society and the destruction of freedoms by inches though he does not see it to be the destruction of freedom is the one panacea so obvious that he marvels at the doctrinaires who resist or suspect the process it has been necessary to waste so much time on this deplorable individual because the circumstances of our generation give him a peculiar power under the conditions of modern exchange a man of that sort enjoys great advantages he is to be found as he never was in any other society before our own possessed of wealth and political as ever was any such citizen until our time of history with all its lessons of the great schemes of philosophy and religion of human nature itself he is blank the practical man left to himself would not produce the servile state he would not produce anything but a welter of anarchic restrictions which would lead at last to some kind of revolt unfortunately he is not left to himself he is but the ally or flanking party of great forces which he does nothing to oppose and of particular men able and prepared for the work of general change who use him with gratitude and contempt were he not so numerous in modern england and under the extraordinary conditions of a capitalist state so economically powerful i would have neglected him in this analysis as it is we may console ourselves by remembering that the advent of the servile state with its powerful organization and necessity for lucid thought in those who govern will certainly eliminate him our reformers then both those who think and those who do not both those who are conscious of the process and those who are unconscious of it are making directly for the servile state what of the third factor what of the people about to be reformed what of the millions upon whose carcasses the reformers are at work and who are the subject of the great experiment do they tend as material to accept or reject that transformation from free proletarianism to servitude which is the argument of this book the question is an important one to decide for upon whether the material is suitable or unsuitable for the work to which it is subjected depends the success of every experiment making for the servile state the mass of men in the capitalist state is proletarian as a matter of definition the actual number of the proletariat and the proportion that number bears to the total number of families in the state may vary but must be sufficient to determine the general character of the state before we can call that state capitalist but as we have seen the capitalist state is not a stable and therefore not a permanent condition of society it has proved ephemeral and upon that very account the proletariat in any capitalist state retains to a greater or less degree some memories of a state of society in which its ancestors were possessors of property and economically free the strength of this memory or tradition is the first element we have to bear in mind in our problem when we examine how far a particular proletariat such as the english proletariat today is ready to accept the servile state which would condemn it to perpetual loss of property and all the free habit which property engenders next be it noted that under conditions of freedom the capitalist class may be entered by the more cunning or the more fortunate of the proletariat class recruitment of the kind was originally sufficiently common in the first development of capitalism to be a standing feature in society and to impress the imagination of the general such recruitment is still possible the proportion which it bears to the whole proletariat 
the chance which each member of the proletariat may think he has of escaping from his proletarian condition in that particular phase of capitalism such as is ours today is the second factor in the problem the third factor and by far the greatest of all is the appetite of the dispossessed for that security and sufficiency of which capitalism with its essential condition of freedom has deprived them now let us consider the interplay of these three factors in the english proletariat as we actually know it at this moment that proletariat is certainly the great mass of the state it covers about nineteen twentieths of the population if we exclude ireland where as i shall point out in my concluding pages the reactions against capitalism and therefore against its development towards a servile state is already successful End of section 12